Use the table below, which is from a study on heart disease and smoking, and a 0.005 significance level to test if smoking and heart disease are related. So the phrases I've underlined clearly indicate that we're dealing with a hypothesis test, right? We have a significance level, they're asking us to test something, and we're supposed to test that these two categories are related. So the fact that there are two categories that we're looking at in this contingency table and trying to see if they are related, or in other words, dependent upon one another, it indicates we're dealing with a chi-squared test for independence. So let's start with a claim for this problem. The first thing we want to know is that, you know, in this problem it's actually giving us HA as the claim because it says that smoking and heart disease, so smoking and heart disease are related, right? And that's another way of saying they are dependent upon one another. So let's start with HO which says that the two categories are independent. And HA says that the two categories are dependent. All right, and from there we're going to work with the data. So I'm just going to put uh, the observed values here in a column and we'll work straight across, right? The observed values are just these four cells. All the other cells are totals, right? So let's put the four cells down here. It's 25, 10, 14, and 51. Okay, now let's put the expectations here in the problem, the expectations. So when we go down the uh, list here for the expectations, remember how we do this, we just say that what? Well, it's row total minus column total divided by grand total. Okay, now for the expectation for 25, it's going to be 35 times 39 divided by 100, right? So 35 times 39 divided by 100. So 35 times 39 divided by 100, and it gives us 13.65, 13.65. Now we're going to do the same thing for a category where 10 is in. That's going to be 35 for the row total, 61 for the column total divided by 100. So 35 times 61 divided by 100. We get the answer 21.35. All right, let's repeat this again. It's going to be for 14. It'll be 65 times 39 divided by 100. So 65 times 39 divided by 100. And we get 25.35. And then lastly, for 51. In the case of 51, we'll have 65 times 61. So 65 times 61 divided by 100. And we get the answer 39.65, 39.65. Okay, so that's observed and expected. Our next product of the process is to do observed minus expected. Okay, now we'll just subtract these two and get that difference. And again, in this scenario, the difference will be common throughout the table. So once I get that difference of 11.35, I know that all the others will have that same difference. It's just sometimes it'll be negative. Like 10 minus 21 is negative 11.35, right? 14 minus 25 is negative 11.35. And then 51 minus 39 is positive 11.35. And again, it has to sum to zero for this scenario. Okay, then observed minus expected quantity squared is our next step of the process. So we just have to square 11.35, and once we do that, we'll get the answer 128.823, It's gonna be the same throughout the table here, so because all these numbers are the same, right? All right, now our next step is observed minus expected quantity squared divided by expected. And this is our important column because this is the one that will eventually give us our test statistic. So we're taking this 128.823. I'm going to store that as a variable x in my calculator because you see that it's being used in the table over and over and over again in this column. And each time I'm going to divide it by its expectation to see what we get. So I'll have this 128, right? 823 divided by 13.65. When I do that, I get 9.438. 
I'll repeat the process again, that 128 number divided by 21.35. I get the answer 6.034. That 128 number again, divided by 25.35. And I get the answer 5.082. And then lastly, we'll do 39.65, sorry. Actually, excuse me, 128 points. So we use the 128 number, 128.823, divided by 39.65 and we'll get the answer 3.249. All right, now sum that column and you will have your chi-squared test statistic. So we'll do 9.438 plus 6.034 plus 5.082 plus 3.249. Okay, so just double check your numbers. Make sure you didn't type anything incorrectly. And hit enter, and there's your chi-squared test statistic, 23.803. All right, now, since that's our chi-squared test stat, our next step is to get our critical value so we can compare our chi-squared test stat against that critical value. Let's get another sheet of paper out and do that next. Let's take a look at our rejection region now. We'll draw a chi-squared curve here. And remember our test is a right-tailed test, so the rejection region is, is here on the right. So we're looking for the chi-squared critical value that's on this number line at that location that separates the reject region from the do not reject HO region. This chi-squared value will be alpha 0 0.005, and the degrees of freedom, remember, is row, the number of rows minus one, the number of columns minus one, which in our case is one because we had two of each the row and the columns. All right, and then when we're done, We'll go to the table, look up 0 0.005 and the number 1, and we'll come up with our critical value. So let's go do that now, and we'll have our rejection region clearly delineated. Okay, so we're on our chi-squared table looking up 0 0.005. 0 0.005 with 1 degrees of freedom, we get the answer 7.87944. Okay, so we found the answer to be 7.879. Now let's compare that against our test statistic, which was chi squared is equal to 23.803. This value is clearly in the tail, so we're going to say we should reject HO and therefore support HA. In this case, our claim is HA, right? Because it said smoking and um, heart disease are related, so we're supporting the alternative hypothesis, which means the two categories are dependent. So let's write our statement then. The sample data supports, so the sample data supports the claim that smoking and heart disease are related. Okay, so that's it. All right, before we leave this problem, this is the last one we're going to do of the chi-squared test of independence, and I just want to point out some patterns you've seen in the results that we've done, and I want to make sure you understand um, why those patterns exist and what they mean. So the pattern that I'm mainly referring to is this column here, observed minus expected. What you see here is that the sum is equal to zero. Um, what you're seeing here is a very spe specific pattern related to the fact that um, this data, this information that we have is laid out in a two by two table. So it turns out that the list of observed minus expected values, they can be listed here, like in the table, you can have them you know, in cells, just like they were in the original data, right? So this is the observed minus expected uh, I guess you would say matrice really is the best way to describe it, but if you haven't taken algebra in a while, you don't remember what matrice is. Let's just say that it's you know four cells that are going to hold these observed minus expected values. If you look at where the data was positioned in our original uh, problem, you will see that basically these observed minus expected values would fall like this. Okay, so if you look back where 25 and 10 were located, 25 and 10 were like here and here. 
14 and then 51. That's how it was originally laid out. When you look at these observed minus expected values, you see this pattern. And when I say you see a pattern, what's the pattern that we're seeing? Well, the pattern that you're seeing is that if you go across and add these numbers, you get zero. Right? If you go across, you get zero. If you go down, you get zero. If you go down, you get zero. That's not a coincidence. That's the pattern that's going to be prevalent all the time. So what I was doing these problems, all our examples were these two by two problems just because they are reasonable to do by hand. You know, they don't take forever. If you have more cells, it takes longer. But if you had, say, a three by three, you would see the same pattern that all three of the cells add up to zero, both going down and across, right? So even if it was a three by three table or even a two by three table, it always has this pattern. The key thing is that a pattern must always be there or you've made a mistake here. Now, one thing that you have to be careful with then is if you're not dealing with a two by two table, don't assume that these numbers will always be the same. It's the unique situation with the two by two table that they'll be exactly the same. The pattern will still remain that they sum up to zero, right? All the columns and all the rows will add to zero. However, it doesn't mean that the number that's there is gonna be identical. So if you had a three by three table, you would not have typically the same three numbers going across, right? You would have perhaps maybe you know three totally different numbers, but those three numbers would still have to add up to zero. And likewise, down, you would have three different numbers, but those numbers would have to add to zero, so on and so forth. So the idea is to you know still do the, the calculations, always do them, but be aware that if it's a two by two, you're gonna have the pattern we saw here. Um, if it's a three by three, the pattern will be related to the, this pattern, but not quite the same in the sense that all these observed minus expecteds will not always be the same. However, they will always add up to zero if you put them in their original positions. The columns will sum to zero and the rows will sum to zero in every case. Okay, so that's the pattern we were seeing. I just wanted to point it out to make sure that you were aware of it. You didn't just blindly use that. You know, make sure you're doing the calculations yourself and checking them, but being aware that you know you will see a certain pattern turn up. And if it's a two by two table, it will be this pattern that we saw here. Okay.